Welcome everyone to the Commissioner's Status Update. It is March 21st, 2023. The time is 10 a.m. I'm calling this meeting to order in attendance our Commissioners Brooks, Matari, and Duncan. Our, well, there is, I know of one change to the agenda and item four is actually being handled at two o'clock today. So we can strike that from the agenda. Any other changes? All right, hearing none, we'll get right down to business. Um, item one, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad activity. Uh, we received an email on March 10th uh, about a um, from a gentleman who would like the commissioners and the mayors of the county to contact the railway and find out um, what is being transported through the counties and the cities. And there did happen to be a, I think this is a coincidental thing, um, a 9,000 gallon diesel spill um, out at BNSF on uh, March 3rd. So I just wanted to get the pulse of my co-commissioners to see if that was anything that you were interested in um, pursuing uh, based on this uh, constituents request to contact the railroad. I'm not even sure, do we have authority on something like that? I mean, I would almost think that's a federal issue. Well, we have the authority to ask questions, but there's nothing, there wouldn't be any action. So, but no. yeah, I, I agree. I mean, to me, I think it's out of our purview. I do understand the concern because of the, um, a lot of the hazardous issues across the country from railway issues, but I'm not sure that, uh, we would be the best body to go down that path. Yeah. I think it might be the either, either the feds or the state, but knowing what's in those cars is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when there's a, an accident, I, I want to know immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, I don't think that's too much to ask that they say, it's just, it's just diesel, which, yeah. you know, all the stuff they carry uh, diesel is probably one of the, the most harmless because mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. they carry some pretty nasty mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And not all those tracks are in all that good shape. Yeah. I've gone down there uh, and uh, seen the tracks actually move yeah. when cars come on it. Now that, I know they're always working on maintenance, but mm -hmm. that's how accidents happen. Well, that seems to be the case throughout the country, though. Pardon? That seems to be the case throughout the country. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, so the question is, I mean, we can ask them, you know, what, what are they hauling? I think we all kind of know the answer. It's, uh, you know, everything from uh, cars and parts to uh, the most uh, caustic uh, chemicals. Correct. The question is, you know, if something were to happen, what, what you know, what's the actionable component, Mr. Sheriff? What would our response be? Uh... And... Go ahead. Um, yeah, OEM was notified within hours of Good. the diesel Good. fuel. fuel um, Robert Norris, Sheriff. We've been in in uh, constant communication with decision makers at BNSF, Union Pacific, uh, Northern Lakes Fire District, and others on this. We have a town hall meeting tentatively scheduled for May the 18th to mm -hmm. address the concerns of the community. Uh, education and training is all part of we'd like to tell the public what we're doing in this event obviously uh, we don't want to rely on a on an entity when it's a public safety that's going to impact our community here specifically in the hauser lake area in that quarter up to to uh, bonner so we're we're we are addressing those concerns and uh, we look forward to narrowing down a date looking at the 18th or the 16th to have these other partners tell the people that yes, we have sensors every 27 miles versus what the federal statute says every 40 miles, and we do this and this and this and this. So, so we are doing that. Great, thank you. I I'm good. I'm happy for the sheriff to handle this. Yep, I am. If you're satisfied. Yeah, I think it's uh, your job to keep us safe, right? That's right. Okay. Yep, and they, they, we do have training. They do have training that they train with Northern Lakes Fire, Kootenai County Fire, Hazmat, Airway, uh, Heights, Fairchild. Uh, I think educating the public on some of these things will help lower the uh, anxiety. 
Mm -hmm. But it certainly is a, uh, there, the public see, appears to be an, have an appetite for this type of a town hall where we can express here's what we're doing. So. Okay. Uh, I have one question. I'm sorry. No, no, um, fine. I think we had a derailment a few years ago up in Bonner County. I was just curious, has there ever been any discussion about how that was handled after action um, and so forth? I was not involved in an after action. Does anybody, uh, Will Klinkifus, do you know if there was an uh, after action report on that event? Not that I was involved with, sir. Right. Yeah. So. so I have asked for some lessons learned from the Palestine event. And what were those lessons learned so we can put some of those in an operational strategy for Kootenai County? And Tiffany from OEM is also involved in this uh, town hall meeting. Okay, great. All right, well, that's it. We can go on to item two. <coughs> and this is the Justice Center expansion budget. We got some not so happy news last week, and uh, our ARPA funds are not going to cover the entire. <coughs> Uh, projected cost of the building. Uh, Craig Shelby with Boughton is on the phone and Corey Trapp here um, with Longwell Trapp is on uh, in person. So um, I don't know who wants to start us off. Bruce, Bill, I guess I will. Um, I think that the project um, is necessary and probably about five years overdue. So I still would like to pursue this. I've had a little bit um, conversation with Brandy, and I think that we have um, fund balance that can cover this and still do some of the two-year projects that I would like to see done, one being the um, pods at the jail being built out. So I think we have enough to cover <coughs> that plus what the overage of this building is going to cost. So what are your thoughts? I'm not happy with the building at all. Haven't been from the beginning. I'm not happy with the way the ARPA funds were dispersed, but I seem to be the only person who has a problem with that. So I will go along with it. But I'm telling you, the money, it keeps creeping up and up and up, and ARPA is sitting there, and we're taking it. And uh, the, the big thing that I see that the county needs to do, and I don't care where we get the money, it's finished those two pods at the jail because the census, the daily count in that jail is unacceptable and somebody's going to sue the pants off of us. <clears throat> so I will vote for the, I will vote for this, but I'm not, I am very unhappy with it. Yeah, uh, uh, if the funds are there, you know, I, I see a need for why we should be doing this, but I agree the mission creep seems to be off the charts here. And, um, you know, the concern is that once we're in on this, and we are to a degree, but not, not to the point of halfway through construction, we're going to be in all the way, no matter what happens. And that could cause uh, significant issues for the future. And I do agree that the jail should be built out. Uh, there's no point in having these expensive uh, storage facilities. Um, so, you know, the, the real question, I think, is just going to come down to it, you know, what can we do to manage the money today moving forward to ensure that we don't put ourselves in a potential bind if something unexpected happens? And what does it do to fund balance? Um, it, uh, Brandy can speak to that. And we're actually going to have in the next week or two, I think, um, a full presentation um, for what our... Brandy has good news, right? <laughs> um, well, I thought it was good news yesterday, but <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so um, this would have to do with your assigned fund balance. That's what I spoke with Chair Duncan about. So just to give some high-level background for Commissioners Vitari and Brooks, um, at the end of every fiscal year, the auditor's office, we have to close, close the finances for the previous year. After our audit is finished in the spring, which is this time of year, we take a look and we calculate what the county's annual personnel and operating expenses are. And then the board has to decide how many months do you want to reserve in emergency funds. So for FY23, our annual personnel and operating expenditures are approximately 98 million. So we just need board direction to decide how many months 
you want to keep in reserves, and I've shown calculations for two, two and a half, and three months. And then anything that is left after we've assigned our emergency funds, that is the money, the surplus money that you have available to dedicate to certain capital projects. So that surplus money is what would be spent on one-time expenditures. We can't use that for ongoing operating costs. We levy for ongoing costs because, you know, anyone could understand you don't want to pay ongoing bills out of your savings account. So I guess I would just look for board direction on how many months are you thinking you want to reserve, and then again, how you would want to assign the surplus fund balance remaining. Sure. I'm interested in what you think. Um, I've spoken with Clerk Locke and the Treasurer, Treasurer Matheson. Um, two and a half months is decent. Obviously, more liquidity as accountants. We like to see that. As bankers like to see that. Um, but two and a half months is a good compromise. Yeah, two and a half months. Yeah, and I've been pushing since I got here for three months, but this is not the year. <laughs> so I am, I am perfectly satisfied with two and a half months. Bruce? Well, this looks like a basic risk management question. You know, what, what has to happen that we need to have two and a half months of uh, reserves, in essence? And then what is the likelihood of that happening? I, I can answer that. Um, the likelihood is, is probably narrow. Um, the, what would happen is we wouldn't be able to collect, if, if we cannot collect property taxes for whatever reason, that is where we would get our cash shortfall. So, so if I don't the know. State if, were to not well, come through yeah, their so revenues. Right. So if the state didn't issue their revenues on time um, or at all, then that's where we would need to. Has it ever happened before? Uh, not in my. We tenure. have closed years with deficits. A couple years ago, we closed with a nine million dollar deficit. For that be, was, because that of was we the, couldn't we had the large uh, project at the jail. So but, years where we spend a lot more, we will we will see deficits. But it's not because we couldn't collect taxes or the state was late. A no. couple years ago, no. That was yeah. just a cost overrun. Yes, I think that was about five five years ago. Yeah. yeah. See, that's my concern with this project, mm -hmm. is that we're going to dig into it because of a cost overrun. Well, I, I think, though, that um, Craig can speak to that because in my estimation is once we agree to the price, the I don't know that we, I guess it depends on, sorry. I don't know, Craig, maybe you can speak to if prices continue to go up. I mean, that's kind of a partnership that the county does not eat all of that. It's kind of, um, you guys have some risk too, is that correct? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking, Wesley. So the process, the way it's set up um, in, in the state of Idaho with the CMGC process is, we're brought on board at this time to help um, provide cost information and really help shepherd the process like we're currently doing. And um, the the step that we when we take that we're at risk with cost is once we're able to go out to the market and bid the scope of work. Um, that will happen once the design is completed. Uh, which right now we're anticipating to be in that August time frame. So currently, with the budgets and the numbers that we've presented, we accounted 6% for inflation and escalation cost for a contingency, 6% uh, for design and estimating contingency. There's a 3% contingency that's carried, that per the contract has to be carried through or into construction. Mm -hmm. And then um, as, as we've put these, assembled these numbers, we've really tried to dive into like the site work, for example, that, that's an area that can can have a lot of cost risk. So we, we feel like we have a good understanding of the site work, feel like we have a good understanding of the scope in general, and then we have these contingencies that are to help buffer that risk from now, for, for the county that is, for now until when we can bid this. And then when we bid it, that's when we really start to reduce some of those cost overrun risks for the county. Does that answer your question? When do we expect to have that? August. August? 
And real quick here, Brandy, could you just run through this bottom section of your handout? Because uh, yeah. So um, on the bottom, I've provided what the board assigned for your surplus funds for fiscal year 22. The total was 16.8 million. So uh, we have the 9 million that was assigned for facilities master plan, 1.5 million for the jail and our building and grounds five-year plan budgets, and then 1.5 million for capital IT projects. And then that top line, anything that's not assigned to a specific project, we put there, and that is assigned for capital purchases throughout the year. So that's what the board uses to purchase. This past year was mostly used for patrol cars, if the AC compressor goes out mid-year, that type of thing. And then I've shown the next column what the current balance is right now, basically what it's been spent down to. And then I would just um, need the board to decide with your surplus funds, do you want to reallocate amongst those line items, how you want to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's not today. No. So today is mostly just a general idea of if we pick two and a half months, you can add 4.6 million to 11 million. Yes. Basically. To that yes. eleven million. Yes. Yep. Okay. And you would yep. You would allocate the four point six amongst those categories. Right. So essentially, you know, fifteen million dollars. And if you do six million for the building, six million for the jail pods, then you still have some stuff left over. So So you have this as an action item on here. So, are you ready to take action on the Justice Center? <clears throat> well, we're in for a penny and for a pound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think the next question is when uh, when is the plan to get the jail completed? Well, to me, um, there's more conversation that needs to be had because if we can't staff it then that's an issue. And then along with staffing, we need to figure out if we can actually afford it. So if we need 10 more full-time deputies, is that, going to max, is that going to max out our um, authority, our spending authority? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger, broader conversation. Well, I guess the question is, let's just play, play the pretend game and say that we can't staff out the jail deputies, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we have this overcrowding issue. And that's a condition. That's not an objection. It's a condition. So what's our plan B if uh, just start letting people out? Uh, uh, start actually, there's, them there's a other. meeting. There's a meeting. I got about 10 emails um, during our last meeting uh, to discuss this. We're getting all the stakeholders involved and talking about what we can do. It wasn't always like that. So I'm not sure if the cities are not citing and releasing, if they're bringing more people in. So that is a conversation that we are having to try to get the numbers down on the front side and then until we can deal with staffing on the back side. Yeah, I mean, well, we know that the state is throttling this too. So, and we have no control over that. Right. And um, so I, I just wonder, you know, at some point you just have to do something. I mean, you know, and we'll just have to figure out how to staff it, but, um, when judges put people in uh, that are not felons and not violent, uh, it hurts the jail. Uh, I would like to see nonviolent uh, people who have uh, not not felonies uh, not in the jail. I don't think they, they belong there. All right, that's a discussion with the judiciary, though. Pardon? That's something we can't control or influence. I know the judges say we'll control it. Yeah. And you deal with it. And I don't like that answer. Um, <clears throat> may I be heard on this subject? Sure. So I, we have a, another agenda item, I think, in the afternoon to discuss that. But um, I do remember an ARPA report, and I remember this sheriff asking individuals from this company of the last projects that they've had, how many have come in under budget or at budget? And they said all of them. So with this ARPA report, I want to say it was 20, approximately 20 million for the project and 4 million for the HVAC. So what number are we at now? Uh, so on Thursday, the initial report with all of the contingency that was already talked about by Craig, it's um, over $30 million for the three courtrooms. 
which for a net of three over, courtrooms. Yes, for addition of three courtrooms, all of the attorney um, prosecuting attorneys, and then the holding cells and stuff like that. So, I don't want <clears throat> to get too far off track because because we have the other item on the agenda I think that's going to take some time today so um, we I can talk about focusing back on this subject I'm, mm -hmm. although I'm not a commissioner I am a, an elected official here mm -hmm. and I believe that uh, 30 plus million dollars for three netting three courtrooms when I had questions for this company from day one and now we are up into the 30 plus million dollars. I don't want to add to the federal deficit just because we've been out a lot of this money. I think there's a wiser choice that can be made with this money than going forward with 30 plus million dollars for netting three courtrooms. Mm -hmm. But thank you. All right. What do you want to do? <clears throat> well, I just think that we need to tie in the jail somehow. I realize it's separate, but one is going to be at the expense of the other if we if we keep allowing this mission creep, and that's my concern. I'm not averse to the Justice Center. In fact, I, I think it should be done. It's just the question of it, are we going to say yes to the Justice Center now and then deal with the, the jail completely later and not look at it comprehensively and just one by one, which is fine if that's what it's going to be. Or uh, do we want to say, okay, what is it going to cost to finish the jail? And then what are we left with as far as, you know, our surplus funds? And is it reasonable? Mm -hmm. um, because if the, if the decision is go with the Justice Center and forget about the jail because there's not enough money, then that's one question to answer. If the other is we've got enough money for both, and we feel comfortable we can stay within the budget on the Justice Center, then great, no problem. That's that's where I'm leaning. Okay. And yeah. Well, we've gone from, when we first started this thing, $22 million for the Justice Center. In 2019. Center. And a lot of and, life has happened in four years. And then uh, about a year later, uh, they were in here telling us, and I said, how much for the whole thing? And it's on record. It, $45 million. And I believe that's what we're really looking at is $45 million. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't, why don't we just say yes now and decide in August when we get our final bid numbers after the design is done? Because that's the only way we're going to know. So, Corey, can you speak to that? So, what happens at that point? We go out to bid and everything, then design is finished. So when the drawings are done in August, um, they'll put it out for bid, Bouton will. We'll get a guaranteed maximum price at that point. Guaranteed maximum yeah, price. The GMP, which is what Craig was talking <clears throat> about. And we'll have the, the finite number right now because it's based upon six sheets of drawings. Right. It's a pretty, it's, it's a, more of a square footage cost analysis of it. Mm -hmm. So like you said, he's got all that contingency built into it anticipating some potential increases in prices, um, but we're going to work on fine-tuning everything and look for ways to continue to save money as we're designing the building so that we can get it in at that cost or under that cost. The ultimate goal is to bring it in under mm -hmm. that cost. So, but we're putting it, but like Craig says, they have the contingencies in there to protect, try to protect for some inflation at this point moving forward. So what is that cost? Cost for you said, bring it in under it. That cost what? The the I think it's the thirty two thirty three million whatever was presented okay. last week. That's, yeah. Yeah. Just want to be clear. Yeah. Yep. Well, it sounds like we just pull the trigger in August, and that we just proceed, but make the final decision based upon these cost numbers. I mean, because they could. You, is it possible you could come in at thirty four or thirty five million? It, yeah, depending on what happens with inflation. Yeah. Of course. That's the, that's the great unknown. Okay. Uh, of course. And so if it comes in at, let's just say, $36 million, we probably want to revisit this. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's always an option all along the way. It's just how much are we going to contractually owe 
you know, your company, um, uh, LCA and Boughton. And, and as we're going through this, we're, we're going to, Craig is going to, up, they're going to continually update the cost estimate too as we work through the design. There'll be a design development um, cost estimate. There'll be probably a, a 30, 60, and a 90% cost estimates, some, something like that too. So it's not like we're going to, we have this estimate now and then we're going to, you're not going to know anything until August. Okay. We're going to keep you updated along the way too mm -hmm. on where things are going. That's fair enough. Yep. I've just had trouble with this all along. And uh, I've talked to a number of people uh, in the court system and a number of people in law enforcement. And there is an answer that the judges hate. It's called night court. And it does a lot of positive things for uh, our system here in, in Kootenai County. Bob? I'm sorry. <laughs> Your microphone. Robert Norris, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I night Court. Night, that, that's, many communities have gone to Night Court. Um, yeah, absolutely. The way this economy is going, I'm sure there's going to be buildings on the market here uh, here before long that we can snag. I. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I guess I'll save my other comments for public comment because I think this is a ludicrous waste of taxpayer money. I think it was rushed from the beginning, and here we are. Well, I, I would have to disagree. Four years is hardly rushed, and five years overdue is hardly rushed. But, Carlene, you have something to add? Yes, good morning, Commissioners. Carlene Barringer, for the record. I just want to um, remind everybody that even if we did go to night court, I would have to double my staff. Everything would have to be doubled. So that's something that is a serious consideration. Um, and, uh, and that's ongoing costs. That's not one-time costs. Mm -hmm. Ongoing. Yeah. So we'd have to have more clerks, more judges, mm -hmm. everybody yeah. um, would have to decide whether you're on the day shift or the evening shift. Yeah. So. All right, uh, Brandy. So would you prefer me to put a discussion item on the business meeting for next Tuesday to get your decisions on how you want to allocate these funds? Because irregardless of the building discussion, it's just something we do annually. Sure. And it's the time of year to get it done. Yeah. So are, should I do a discussion item or an action item for next week? I, I would prefer it at 1.30. I'd prefer it before that. Its own meeting? Its own meeting. It's always been its own meeting. Okay. I just would prefer that. That way we can relax and not have to feel rushed with thousands of dollars sitting in the audience. Okay. Thank you. Is that agreeable? Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you want to make a motion that we're going to go ahead with the justice um, expansion with using fund balance to make up the difference. And obviously we have a chance to revisit uh, I move that we proceed with using fund balance for the Justice Center expansion and uh, that our final decision will be when we get the final numbers for the cost of this business, which will be by August of this year. I can agree with that. I second the motion. Bill Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Matari? Aye. Chair Duncan? Aye. All right. Uh, now we can go on to item three, and that's county providing security at private events. And... Uh, so one of the things that uh, led to this coming uh, being put on the meeting today is the fact that I don't really see how taxpayers have voted for the county to provide security and pay for that uh, at private events. And um, so what I wanted to do is just talk about that. Uh, we had uh, a private event last year where the county paid, uh, I think, around $50,000 in security services. And I think it's, uh, it's only prudent that if an entity, uh, a city wants to issue a permit for an event, that the par private party that gets the permit is responsible for paying for the security of the event. Are we talking about the fair? No. 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 Okay. No. We're, we're talking about cities that hold various... No private things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I... So I, I see two problems. Number one, we have zero... Um, authority in the cities so they can issue all the permits for all the wacky events they want to. Number two, I'm not going to take that discretion away from the sheriff. So I think that operationally he needs to make those decisions. Um, and that's 
I don't know, that's kind of where I fall on that. I don't like it, and I really, um, like you, have the same sentiment. Like, I think that's wrong that the city's actions should cause the county taxpayers money. But here we are. Well, I think there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, seeking reimbursement beforehand or requesting it. Or making it a requirement. You know, making, it, uh, making it at least a public issue because I don't think people realize county taxpayers are subsidizing these events. Mm -hmm. And if anything, you know, it, it, I understand and I wouldn't want to take away the sheriff's ability to make those decisions. On the flip side, let's at least put the cards on the table mm -hmm. and make it known that when the city wants to hold events that require additional security and they're not requiring the private entity to pay for that security, that they're transferring or cost shifting onto the county taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't been happening. Right. So I would be in favor if the sheriff wanted to have that public conversation. This is how much this event cost the county last year. This is how much we're expecting it to cost this year, unless you're deciding that you're not going to have um, extra staff out there. So um, I would love to have that the public understand what these events in the cities are costing the county taxpayers and your sheriff's department. Hi, Robert Norris. Right now, do we have such a policy in the county area? Uh, like policy covering what? Uh, if a, an event is likely to attract X amount of people, you need X amount of, of the deputies. Um, do we have such a policy? No. Uh, so I, I would recommend that's where we would we should consider the board should consider going. Uh, number two, unfortunately, with what the chair was alluding to is mutual aid and the first responsibility of a county sheriff in 44 counties in Idaho is to keep the peace. So I have to provide services to keep the peace, and that's the, that's the first responsibility of every Idaho sheriff. And I appreciate that. Maintain the peace. And so uh, what I might agree with you, and I think there is merit to have a conversation. For an example, the sheriff has sole authority on the water to say, okay, we need X amount of deputies for you're going to have a wedding, you're going to have this, okay, you're going to have to hire six deputies on six or four boats and this, 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 and this. Here's the fee. Twenty thousand dollars, and then they pay the county twenty thousand dollars. So we we do have that authority on the water. Don't have that type of uh, ordinance or authority on land. So I, I think yeah. that's a conversation to have. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, under mutual aid and the Idaho Constitution, I have to provide service regardless. Yeah. So and a good service you provide and your team, and I've always appreciated the KCSO. And we appreciate you too. Well, uh, real quick though, but there's a difference between you having to have to provide service and you calling up people to be paid overtime to sit and wait in a room in case something happens, right? Oh yeah. No, so there, there's a lot of dynamics. That, so uh, that's really the issue. Is it's not that you shouldn't provide service. The fact is whether or not we're going to call people up for overtime to sit in a big room and wait until something happens because of a private event that's being uh, uh, allowed to occur. And I think that's the real difference. And I guess I give you the water example. Um, mm -hmm. If I have intel that is credible that there is likely to be a uh, disruptive uh, event at a or a entity at an event, guess what? I can charge more, and I can say, "Hey, you're going to need X mm -hmm. amount." If uh, Gazer wants to pay for sheriff security because of an event, and then we get wind that there's a, another competing event that wants to interrupt it, I can say you're going to need twice as many deputies. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and in this event, in what you speak of, we did have intel that it was going to be a interrupted. Right. So we did have to be prepared for that. Um, I, I think the first discussion would be with the cities to seek their cooperation to say, hey, if you have a large-scale event, we have large-scale events at the raceway. That create a big problem in the fall. And so, yeah, I, I think that it's time to have those discussions, that's for sure. Because I mean, they could cancel those events if they knew that there would be a huge security risk, too. Or a huge 
bill, bill to pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I mean, it, it, they have that under their purview. Oh yeah. So. I have that purview on the water. But. Yep. Thank you. All right. Anything else on that? Um, well, would the board be open to at least putting a letter together? You know, asking that you know the cities consider reimbursing the counties for these private events. And at least making this public, because if they want to have these events, at least let's let's like I said, put the cards on the table, and let's make it known that what they're asking the county citizen to do is to subsidize the security for their events, even if they know that there are going to be significant security issues, especially at a national level. Another cliche for you: if you don't ask, you don't get. Mm -hmm. So. So I'm I'm happy if <clears throat> you and the sheriff want to come up with language and then present it to the board and, okay. and look at that. Okay. So. Well, I don't know if it's a sheriff position as much as it is as a BOCC position. I mean, uh, but you brought up things that we didn't necessarily consider that it's a mutual aid and that those kinds of things. So I'd want to make sure that our letter didn't go outside of this conversation today. So that that would be my only reason to run it by you. So, yeah, and you yeah. have to play nice in the sandbox with everybody anyway. Yes, we do. Yep. Yeah, so. well, it would not, uh, it's not about the mutual aid. It's not uh, with the intent of interfering with that. I think that that's there, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in case you need the extra resources for unplanned events. But the planned events, I think, are the ones that we're really uh, addressing here. Yeah, I, uh, I, I believe I agree with you in concept. That uh, I, I believe that uh, municipalities should have an ordinance in place that if you're going to attract X amount of people, then you should have to hire X amount of peace officers for law enforcement purposes. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that there is a formula that other agencies use that agencies in Kootenai County that at one time it was Sleepy Hollow and we could just, you know, absorb it. It's not the case anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll work with you on a letter. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, item four is going to be discussed at two o'clock today. And item five, KCSO presentation of uses for Kootenai North building. And Lieutenant Klinkafis, are you going to give us this presentation? Yes, ma'am. Will Klinkafus, uh, Sheriff's Office for the record. Um, so... We're here today to present a proposal to you. Thankfully, we're not here asking you for $34 million, so we're going to change that up a little bit today, uh, change the dynamic of this meeting. So as you well know, the county bought the Kootenai Electric Compound uh, approximately three, four years ago, and it is it will be available in December to be occupied. So we have a tentative proposal put together uh, to move the operations bureaus of the sheriff's office to that campus. Um, Right now, the Sheriff's Office bureaus are in approximately four different buildings uh, spread around three different campuses. Uh, so the goal is, is to uh, bring this more in, in efficient workspaces, uh, bringing all those, uh, all those sections together onto one campus. Um, in 2021, there was a comprehensive plan put together uh, for the county. It was a proposal. Uh, there was a part of that was to add a 5,500 square foot addition to the sheriff's office admin building to allow for more space uh, for for things. Uh, this will actually uh, be a lot cheaper than that. It was proposed at 2.5 million in 2021, which is probably closer to the 4 million. Uh, so, occupying that space up there with the limited rehab that is needed will be much cheaper than adding to the current sheriff's office campus. Uh, additionally. Uh, at the Sheriff's Office campus that we're at now, you know, parking is the premium. Uh, we've already run out of parking for the current employees that are there. The Kootenai uh, Electric Compound has plenty of parking. Uh, as you know, there's a bulk fuel station already in place up there, so all the fuel can be purchased in bulk, so there'd be a savings to the county in that respect as well. Uh, KCSO would be vacating approximately 30,000 square feet of space that could be used for other county departments. It's well known that not, not only the sheriff's office, but other county departments are, are need, in need of space. And so this move would also allow other departments to occupy the 30,000 square feet of space approximately uh, that the sheriff's office would um, be coming out of. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'd, I'd be opening it up to questions from you folks. Um, 
based on the proposal I gave to you last week, what your what would be your questions? Well, can you walk us through it? Yeah, of course. Yep. So do you guys have the PowerPoint available to you, the hard copy? I have the hard copy. I think they both have electronically. Okay. So if you look at the, uh, the second slide, that's just the overall uh, plan of Kootenai Electric, uh, the compound, the actual plat without any uh, additions at all uh, from the sheriff's office. Going to slide number three, that shows the administrative area of the Kootenai Electric building and the areas that would be set aside for each section being record, civil, uh, operation support, administration, and uh, patrol command sergeants, um, patrol command in the sergeants area. Uh, what is not included in there, uh, there's that lobby area in the front um, that is not uh, delegated obviously to anything specific just because it's the uh, lobby area. And then there's a big training building or a big training area that's to the, to the north end that is not part of that slide. <coughs> Any questions on, on that part? Is there room for driver's license and motor vehicle license to each have one or two stations? So yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, so we checked with uh, the state of Idaho in reference to that. Uh, we asked them what the feasibility would be to add four stations uh, for like driver's license up there for instance. The first answer we got was that's a budgetary item for them. So a lot of the, uh, most of the equipment belongs to the state and we're already behind the curve ball. So we're looking at fiscal year 25 before we would possibly even get that equipment. Secondly, they said there's legislation pending that is going to limit the number of people that actually need to go to driver's license offices, i.e. Re renewals would be done online. So they're expecting that the number of customers having to go to driver's license offices will decline in, the, in future years with that. Uh, thirdly, we've looked at our statistics internally and the statistics don't really bode out the need for additional driver's license offices. You can get same-day appointments in Post Falls and generally in Coeur d'Alene uh, for driver's licensing. There's no backlog necessarily that we can see statistically that would need, there would be a need for that uh, in Kootenai Electric. So the answer would be yes, there is room for it. We could fit that in there somehow, but it doesn't appear that statistically it's necessarily a need. Okay, I'd like to keep an eye on that just because I think it would be a good service to our folks in the north sure. to not have we to can, come all the way downtown or yep. Post Falls. Yes, ma'am. So. Okay. okay, moving to the next slide. Uh, it's the, uh, the biggest thing that you see there is a recreation safety section. So this is the warehouse area of the Kootenai Electric building, including the, the side building that was added later that is de designated for detectives. And so as you see, uh, there's many uh, bays available uh, for the recreation safety section to occupy. They have equipment stored on four different locations within the county. So that's pretty problematic to have to figure out where the trailer stored, how to get it, where to get it to a boat ramp. Uh, this would allow them to have all that uh, localized in one area. Uh, additionally, the county shop would move out there as well. Uh, they've, they've needed some room for expansion for a while and that will give them the opportunity to expand their area of operations as well. Uh, one of the things that that facility does not have organic to it is a place that we can uh, have evidence storage and processing. And so that area right now that is marked out for that is actually a large open area as you've probably seen before. So we would have to build that out and that's part of the written proposal of what the preliminary cost for that would be. Um, uh, the detectives building is pretty well situated. There's a few things that we would need to do to change that up uh, for detectives to occupy that organically. And then additionally, there's more room there to expand as needed in the future if we ever needed to. Uh, next slide goes over the basement area of the building. It's, it's only about a third of the administrative area. So downstairs currently they have their gym. And so there's only three main areas down there, actually four that we could use for, uh, for operational space. The utility areas are kind of that. They're just, you can't really do anything else with those. But the gym's down there. There's a room downstairs that says long-term uh, record storage. That's where they store their records currently. It's fireproofed and it's fire rated. So that would be a great space for us to actually put our records down there, uh, the long-term stuff. And then um, just more occupied, uh, more space that we could occupy for other divisions as needed in the future. Next slide that's a graphic shows the uh, entire compound from the air. Uh, the yellow line is the current fencing that is out there. Uh, the black line is what we're proposing to add for the for fencing. Uh, the 
the employee parking area that we would make as employee parking currently does not is not secured. So we would ask to add fencing that would secure that that area for uh, employee parking. And then the evidence vehicle storage area, we would also need to fence that in and razor wire. Obviously, for obvious reasons, it has to be protected a little more so than than the average. And part of the uh, initial proposal for the fence cost uh, is was in that document as well that I provided. Next slide, uh, just an overall view of the current Sheriff's Office campus, just kind of gives you a mind, mindset of where the actual buildings are that, that are, uh, would be uh, vacated by the County Sheriff's Office. And those include the Compton Building, which is on the, uh, the north side of the Sheriff's Office compound. Um, you know, that's up in the air of what we would do with that. Currently, that houses IT and the gym. Um, so that's kind of a wild card in this whole process. The area that, the, that is listed as the county shop and recreation safety, the proposal is that the current KCSO maintenance section would occupy that area once it's vacated. Um, they have a need for more space like everybody else does for storage of equipment and things, and that would give them ample space uh, to occupy uh, for their, their section. Uh, the Pierce Clegg building, which is currently occupied by our training, coordinators, our background investigators, a little bit of evidence in the county coroner. Uh, the plan would be to, no KCSO uh, people would be in that building at all. And then additionally, the, the building that's labeled the MCC building, that's where we used to store the mobile command center, um, would also be vacated. I believe there's a possible proposal from the coroner's office right now pending that they would ask, uh, they're, they're possibly going to ask for the Pierce Clegg building and the MCC building as a whole for their area. And I don't know if that's been pushed forward or not yet, but uh, so those are those are two other areas that would be available for other county departments to occupy. Uh, the biggest one would be the uh, KCSO admin, uh, current admin building. If you go to the next slide, that is the footprint of, of that building. There's approximately 12, between 12 and 13,000 square feet of space there. Um, obviously, if, if those that have been there before, the lobby is set up for customer service already. There's service windows already built into the lobby up there. So that building is pro is proposed to be vacated by us and could be used for anybody within the county. To my knowledge, there's nobody jumping and chomping at the bit for that yet, but you know, that's that's for... I have a feeling they will be after they see this meeting today. Okay, this is why well, I there, wanted you to go through There it. we go, all right, yes ma'am. And I'm available anytime if anybody has questions or needs a tour or whatever that whatever needs to be done. So the next couple slides just go over um, uh, pictures of the buildings that would be vacated by KCSO. Obviously, we talked about 12,000 square feet of the uh, the admin space on that slide. Going to the next slide, there is the Pierce Clegg Building. Pierce Clegg Building is kind of an anomaly. It was built originally as a uh, work release center. So it's, it, when you look at it, it looks odd in the sense that it's kind of built as a prison type situation, but it has been remodeled in certain ways uh, for the coroner and for um, for our evidence folks to occupy it. But again, there's another uh, about 13,000 square feet of space that could be utilized by any other county entity. Look, luckily, there's plenty of showers and bathrooms in that building, the way it was built, so there's no, no need for that. Uh, next slide is the graphic pictures of that building for anybody that would need to see that. Uh, moving on to the MCC building, that's about a 40 by 60 shop with uh, three roll-up doors. One, uh, there's one on the south side, two on the north, so it is actually a drive-through. One of the possibilities for that building, I, I've already spoken to and given a tour to CityLink. Apparently, they don't have a shop to work on their stuff. Uh, they've looked at it, and that shop, that building would actually work very well for them, they say. Uh, it is um, insulated and heated. It does not have bathroom facilities or anything in it currently, but that obviously could be changed with a little bit of a model. Um, moving on, just some overall pictures of the Pierce Clegg building and the Compton building just to show the, the parking ability, the access off of Dalton Avenue, um, if anybody had any questions on any of that stuff like that. Uh, Compton building is the next slide. So again, that's kind of one of those wild cards in that 2021 uh, master plan. Uh, there was talk in that to move IT and the gym to the current KCSL maintenance building, which is inside of the jail compound. 
Um, if that did go to fruition, then this building would be able to be occupied by somebody or tore down. There was one of the options in that plan was to actually tear that down and create more parking. Um, this building is situated and was used originally as a, I believe, a vehicle registration uh, building at one point. So it does have some service window capabilities and some ability for the, the public to come up to it and utilize it for that. So again, that's kind of a wild card building, uh, whether or not you decide to move the uh, IT folks out of there. If the operations bureaus are moved north to Kootenai, uh, the Kootenai Electric Building, we would need to find a space for a gym for the folks that do currently work in the jail. We wouldn't want to take that away from them, so we'd have to find a space uh, for, for a gym for those folks. And the last slide just shows the footprint of the current KCSO jail maintenance building. That's the building they currently occupy versus what they would move into um, if the CUNY Electric proposal was, was uh, ratified. So that's kind of the walkthrough of the, the buildings that we would be vacating and uh, the plan to, to move the folks north. Okay. And Sheriff, where would your office be since you must stay in Coeur d'Alene? My office would be in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We have a satellite office in uh, Hayden, but uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho would be the, uh, the county seat and where my office would be. Thank you. Questions? Well, we're, we're talking about things like we're talking about space. We're talking about courtrooms. And if we're moving all these people over to the the detectives uh, and the record storage area would make great courtrooms. It could be, yeah. yeah. Very huh? easily could be. Yes, sir. It, it could be reconfigured to that. Without a lot of trouble. Probably not. It's got a close nexus to the jail. You wouldn't have to walk the inmates very far for court appearances, so... I like it. Good thinking. <laughs> Another dynamic that I didn't speak to necessarily was uh, our current detectives division is housed in the in the jail building. So those detectives would move north to Kootenai Electric as well. So that space would be available for additional jail admin, work release. Um, there's some talk about moving the sex offender registration back to that location as well. So that would help the jail uh, footprint a lot to be able to get that space back to be able to use for their their operations. Okay. Questions? How long do you think this uh, space in Hayden would uh, work for the sheriff's office as far as growth into the future? How many years would you say until you feel like you've outgrown it? How many terms do you feel like uh, run as commission? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, probably next 20 years. Is yeah, okay. 20 years is the number I, I think. Right. Currently, we can move into it with, with room to grow, um, and there's plenty of space to do that. Um, so I, I, I think 20 years is a good number. Okay. That it? That's it for me. I mean, I'm slightly familiar with it. I think uh, overall, if no one else is uh, fighting for that space, then it's probably the right move. Um, I probably would like to take 30 days to consider it amongst the other things that are um, hmm. the other moving parts. And then, um, and then I want to meet with you again and, and talk about the different finance things. Can you just tell me to move in? Because you and I talked about a, a tiered approach, like, okay, to move in, it costs this much money. And then down the line, you'll have projects every year. So is that, what is to move in? The two move in was the document that I provided to you. That's what we're preliminarily at. Again, some of this is very preliminary. Um, working with Tom Reed, our maintenance supervisor, on some of the projects. As you can t see, about half of the projects his folks could do in-house, uh, which is a is good bang for our buck. And then there's a there's a few that would have to be contracted out. And then um, the end game number with all the projects together, we're in and around four hundred and fourteen thousand dollars for the initial move in. And that would set us up pretty well uh, in, at, at, at the beginning. Showers in the bunker? That's for showers in the break room and everything, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that, that sets, us up, uh, sets us up pretty well. Um, the only one of the uh, caveats to that is, and Grant Kinsey, I believe, is here, is IT is kind of one of those wild cards out there until we really dig into the facility. He's estimating about $40,000 uh, to do the IT side of it. And that's in here already? It's in there as well. Okay. So, Grant, did you want to? 
chime in here or <clears throat> not much beyond that um, like you said it's a uh, very preliminary a lot of crystal ball magic going on here but um, yeah we do know there are some certain needs that would have to happen immediately uh, wireless infrastructure um, it's the primary way that our patrol cars download all their uh, video evidence when they pull in so we'd have to build that up um, and then connectivity back to um, county infrastructure and we've already kind of brought a proposal to you for that that would be a zero net operational cost for the county based on some other things we're doing with the phone system so um, one question I had and, and perhaps you can answer Commissioner um, is if the technology was retained from um, the existing facility when we purchased it I know that was up in the air at one point the tele there's telecommunications technology that we were maybe or maybe not going to the get. the offer that you made was accepted Oh, okay so, so um, part of that 40,000 that I mentioned to will was to account for some of that so that might offset a little bit of that too okay thank you thank you Grant yeah. all right anything further on this proposal okay nope then I will go ahead and call for public comment and I will ask uh, is there anybody on the telephone who would like to make public comment All right, uh, hearing none, anybody in the audience? Okay, well, time is 10.56 and meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming.